Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a semi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and businesses and business practices that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about the AKC or American Kennel Club. I know I briefly mentioned them in my episode about puppy mills and how they can pose as dog breeders and how the AKC does little to actually stop the puppy mill practice and how they actually recommend shady breeders to people. So I apologize if there's just a touch of repeat information in this episode, but many of you asked me many months ago to just cover the AKC by itself. And so here we are today because I was obviously curious, how corrupt can they be and what else might they be hiding? Also as a content warning, there will be discussions of animal abuse in this episode. So if animal abuse in general is upsetting to you, then please go ahead and just skip this episode and stay tuned for the next one because I know it can get a bit rough. So anyway, Let's get into the episode. Breeding dogs for show became especially popular in the 1800s. And we can't really talk about the AKC without recognizing what they came from. And then we'll be able to take a look at how responsible for this they might actually be. Breeding dogs for looks alone is a massive issue because while purebreds may be best in show, they can actually be worse in health. For example, by age five, half of all Cavalier King Charles Spaniels will develop a serious heart condition. Scientific American writes, for almost 4,000 years, people have been breeding dogs for certain traits, whether it be a physique ideal for hunting pests like badgers or a temperament suitable for companionship. But the vast number of modern breeds and the roots of their genetically caused problems came about the past two centuries as dog shows became popular and people began selectively inbreeding the animals to have specific physical features. Over time, the American Kennel Club and other such organizations have set standards defining what each variety should look like. To foster the desired appearance, breeders often turn to line breeding, a type of inbreeding that mates direct relatives such as grandmother and grandson. When a male dog wins numerous championships, for instance, he is often bred widely, a practice known as popular sire syndrome, and his genes, healthy or not, then are spread like wildfire throughout the breed. As a result, purebred dogs not only have increased incidences of inherited diseases, but also heightened health issues due to their bodily frames and shapes, such as hip dysplasia in large breeds like the German Shepherd and the St. Bernard, and paddler luxation, or persistent dislocation of the kneecap in toy and miniature breeds. Many bulldogs have severe breathing problems. Many huskies seem predisposed to autoimmune disorders. Pugs are at high risk for eye issues, the most serious being their eyes literally popping out of its socket. Beagles seem more prone to epilepsy. Shih tzus may have wobbly kneecaps that can pop out of place. The list goes horribly on and on. Thanks to their mixed genes, mutts are less likely to have received a high dose of any particular breed's genes and are far less prone to these genetic conditions. That's not to say that every single one of these show dogs is extremely sickly, but celebrating purebreds specifically seems a bit messed up after reading this. But then again, that's why AKC recommends reputable breeders, right? (laughs) We'll get there. To celebrate these breeds, the National American Kennel Club began in 1876 and the Westminster Dog Show the year afterwards in 1877. The American Kennel Club No National Attack began in 1884. At this time, there were only 13 breed clubs and to this day, the AKC calls itself the recognized and trusted expert in breed health, training, and information for dogs. Other sources say the American Kennel Club was founded 110 years ago by a group of American blue bloods who pledged to do everything to advance the study, breeding, exhibiting, running, and maintenance of purity in thoroughbred dogs. At the time, pure bloods were status symbols owned exclusively by the wealthy and prized for their strength, skill, and intelligence as much as for their looks. But during the 1940s, as the middle class sucked in vast numbers of new members with aspirations of gentility, these Americans began to insist on pure breeds too, and their popularity took off. In 1944, the AKC registered 77,400 dogs. That jumped to 235,978 in 1949, and by 1970, the club was issuing papers on a million dogs a year. The total in the year 2000, 1.4 million. 
The number of AKC-sponsored dog shows has increased just as dramatically. In 1894, there were a mere 11 all-breed shows. By 1954, there were 384, and last year, a total of 1.3 million dogs competed in 1,177 different exhibitions. Then, as now, the idea was to show off the owner's prize breeding stock. Purebred doesn't mean better, but slowly, that's what the words seem to become equated with. Smaller dog shows just seem to be more of the upper class becoming far more popular, and as some sources would argue, far less controlled. After all, if they're registering 1 million dogs these days, just how much are they really looking into these dogs' health? If they call themselves the expert on breed health, then how can they still celebrate these poor animals that are suffering from severe health issues because of how they were bred in the first place? Let's start answering some of those questions. Does the AKC deserve their title of the leading expert on dog health? Time Magazine states that there are clubs out there, such as the Portuguese Water Dog Club, that requires breeders who advertise in their magazine to submit copies of hip, eye, and heart clearances to prove their dogs aren't suffering from genetic defects. Whereas in terms of the American Kennel Club, some have said that the best use of their pedigree papers is for housebreaking your dog. You could have an immune deficient puppy with severe health problems and the AKC will register them. But hey, this is just one article. Maybe others feel differently, right? Well, it's a pretty widely held belief that AKC papers are a guarantee of health of a dog when the AKC papers are in actuality, nothing more than a registration certificate that identifies the dog as the offspring of a known sire and dad, the dad and mom, born on a known date. This only guarantees the purity of the breed and nothing more. AKC has a massive list of breeders on their website though, and they supposedly conduct checks on these locations. So you would think that, hey, they're making sure that these breeders are reputable. But again, this just really isn't the case. AKC papers do not speak to the quality of breeding and they have an extremely long history of opposing legislation that would actually improve conditions for dogs in mills, though we'll get to AKC and their lobbying in just a bit. The Humane Society has called out the AKC as the worst in show because of this and in 2015 wrote, the AKC regularly fights laws designed to stop puppy mills. And in recent months, two former AKC breeders of merit who had just passed their AKC inspections were reportedly found to be keeping dogs in dismal conditions. When our 2012 report was published, the AKC had opposed more than 80 different laws around the country that would protect dogs from puppy mills. Since then, that number has climbed to more than 150. The AKC even opposed a North Carolina bill modeled after the AKC's own care and conditions policy for breeders. Through its political action committee, PAC, the AKC has funneled thousands of dollars in donations to some of the most aggressively anti-animal welfare politicians in the country. The AKC is sustained by fees breeders pay to register puppies. Simply put, the more dogs registered with the AKC, the richer the organization gets. The organization's PAC then fights many laws that would protect dogs. If you don't understand why a group that claims to support dogs would fight legislation cracking down on puppy mills, just follow the money. The more puppies high volume breeders produce and then register with the AKC, the better it is for the AKC's bottom line. The AKC says it inspects its high volume breeders, but the cases of the former breeders of merit indicate its inspection process is broken. One breeder pleaded guilty to animal cruelty charges. The other sold more than a hundred AKC King Charles Cavalier Spaniels at a dog auction in the heart of Puppy Mill Country, just as the public complaints began to mount on her dog's living conditions. This isn't a new problem. In 2012, an AKC champion Malamute breeder was charged with animal cruelty after 161 emaciated and diseased Malamutes were found on his property. Under oath, he testified he felt confident he was obeying all laws and stricter AKC rules since an AKC inspector had twice recently found him to be in compliance. He was convicted of 91 counts of animal cruelty and sentenced to 30 years in prison with 25 suspended. This is all incredibly sourced material and has been happening for years. If AKC wants to say that they are the leaders in registering purebred dogs, that's fine. That's probably accurate. But to call themselves the leader in dog health, mm -mm, not the case. One of these breeders even says that in these two visits by AKC representative Gene Brennan, he felt confident he was obeying all the laws and even the stricter AKC rules. If having over 160 dogs in a horrible condition on his property and being arrested on 90 counts of animal abuse is obeying strict laws, then I don't wanna know what the looser guidelines are. Again, This happened and went on for years, even after complaints were filed with the police department. It wasn't until a deputy filmed the property and found a deceased dog there that action was even taken in this case. How can anyone, let alone the AKC, claim to advocate the care of animals, but allow something like this to go on? 
I don't really know who the representative Gene Brennan is and I don't care to meet him. The AKC should be ashamed of themselves, but according to them, it's up to the breeders and it's not their fault. Like in what world can you say, we're the leading experts on dog health, but also we just give paperwork and register breeders that abuse and mistreatment shenanigans, that's not our fault. Yet this type of shit keeps happening and AKC takes no responsibility whatsoever. According to one New York Times article, To most animal lovers, the AKC is best known as the go-to place for registering purebred puppies and as the governing body for dog shows, including the Regal Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show. The AKC is dedicated to upholding the integrity of its registry, promoting the sport of purebred dogs and breeding for type and function, according to its mission statement. But the AKC is increasingly finding itself ostracized in the dog world in the crosshairs of animal protection services, law enforcement agencies, and lawmakers who say that the club is lax in performing inspections and that it often lobbies against basic animal rights bills because it could cut into dog registration fees. As recently as 2010, roughly 40% of the AKC's $61 million in annual revenue came from fees related to registration. Critics say a significant part of that includes revenue from questionable breeders like the Hamiltons or so-called puppy mills, which breed dogs en masse with little regard for basic living standards. The Hamiltons, Margaret and James Hamilton, are a couple predominantly featured in this article. In 2011, when the police entered their home, they found 38 dogs in their care. Most were living in small crates filled with fur and feces, the cages stacked on top of one another in a dark basement. A radio bared to drown out the sound of barking and because of the severe incurable health problems, 13 had to be euthanized on the night of their rescue. James Hamilton was a leader in a local AKC Rottweiler club and Margaret was a dog show judge who owned a prize winning Chihuahuas. The AKC had registered four litters from the Hamiltons and somehow, somehow, Margaret's lawyer said the dogs under her care and in control were in good shape, but the dogs that weren't treated, well, she had nothing to do with. Sure, so that's why 62 dogs were seized at their home and 38 under James's care specifically? Sure. Look, maybe this is just a matter of opinion, but I feel that if anyone owns an excessive amount of animals, like, you know, a hundred fucking dogs, then welfare checks should be conducted regularly. Maybe I've just watched too many animal rescue videos that feature animal hoarding, a thing I didn't even know existed. And that kind of thing can get out of hand so fast. I understand that farmers and breeders are naturally going to have a lot of animals, so it's their job, and I'm sure that many of them do it quite well. But the fact that these types of places like the Hamiltons were deemed acceptable or even considered reputable dog breeders is very, very fucking concerning. Now, sure, you might say, hey, there's only so many inspections they can do, their inspectors are overwhelmed, right? I mean, almost half a million litters are registered every year. So they've only got a few thousand inspectors, so it makes sense that they might be a bit overworked. But I want you to just take a guess at how many inspectors they have. Just pause for a moment and just guess how many. Did you guess nine? Because the answer is nine, as in less than 10. As of 2013, when the New York Times wrote that article, nine is how many inspectors they had. This isn't, oh, the inspectors are overwhelmed. That is negligible. Is it any wonder that dogs they register aren't in good health? Their executives make an average of a quarter of a million dollars a year, yet rather than hire some fucking inspectors to be sure that the dogs they vouch for are in good condition, Dennis Sprung, their CEO, makes over a million dollars a year instead. Also, I apologize. I know I'm swearing quite a bit more than normal. I've been trying to slowly cut out my cursing a little bit more in recent episodes, but just, Seeing and reading about how these dogs were treated as nothing more than disposable products is just so infuriating. Not to mention, again, there is zero, like little to no accountability in this whatsoever. Lisa Peterson, the communications director, claims the club is continually working to improve the care and condition of dogs. We are not a law enforcement agency and not responsible for all breeders, Peterson said. We are proactive in ferreting out animal abuse. Peterson of the AKC warned against reading too much into spot inspections, saying they were only a snapshot in time. She added, these very sad cases are not reflective of the AKC. The AKC took no disciplinary action in the Williams case, Peterson said, adding that the group does so based on substantiated allegations. The Williams case is of course yet another situation where dozens of dogs were seized because they were in incredibly poor health. On May 17th, 2012, an AKC inspector said that 34 of the animals were in acceptable condition with only two categories being marked as needs improvement. Those being untreated visible wounds and the construction of the kennels themselves. 
Three months later, 28 were seized and a veterinarian told the court the rescued dogs had ailments that ranged from serious to severe and most were chronic. They appeared to have existed for a substantial amount of time. And yet, as I quoted earlier, the communications director said they were working to ferret out animal abuse. It's funny how one of their nine inspectors sure didn't seem to get that message. Even PETA, who is basically just like the country's largest kill shelter, has called out the AKC. Like if PETA is calling you out for animal abuse and it's not hypocritical, then it's just pathetic on the part of the AKC here. For once, I actually do agree with PETA when they say that the AKC is in part to blame, though that's all the credit I intend to give them. It's not as if other clubs aside from the AKC have these issues either. I'm sure some of them do, but many dog clubs out there do genuinely seem to care about the health and wellness of these animals, not just their breeding. The Swiss Bernese Mountain Dog Club introduced mandatory hip x-rays, for example. The German Shepherd Club of Germany apparently requires health tests like hip and elbow x-rays. If anyone that can read German wants to try and navigate the site and confirm or deny that, it'll be in my sources, but apparently they do. Hell, the US Border Collie Club is even resisting AKC efforts to add Border Collies to the 137 breeds it recognizes because Border Collie owners and breeders know that the AKC recognition will create pressure to breed the dogs for their looks at the inevitable expense of their intelligence and herding instincts. We are concerned that the working ability of our dogs would be completely lost, said Donald McCraig, a breeder in Williamsburg, Virginia, a spokesman for the club. I don't know this breeder at all, but the fact that the intelligence and well-being of the animal seems to come first at this club says a lot about their integrity, especially when you compare it to the AKC, which was founded on looks in the first place. This whole ordeal between Border Collies and the AKC is such a mess that I even found an entire book related to the topic. Not to mention the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel Club has acted too. And time reads, The club voted overwhelmingly last May to reject AKC recognition for another reason, their conviction that the AKC values its own revenues over a dog's welfare. Cavalier breeders do not allow the dogs to be sold in pet stores, which are infamous for buying animals from shady sources, including puppy mills. In fact, most dog experts routinely warn buyers not to deal with pet stores at all. The AKC insists though, that the Cavalier Club drop its prohibition as a condition of affiliation. Why would it take such a position? perhaps because some 7% of the group's $21 million in dog registration earnings comes from pet store sales. There's far more examples of this too. The Portuguese Water Dog Club, as we mentioned earlier, not only requires hip, eye, and heart clearances, but in 1987, they financed researchers at major veterinary schools to develop screenings for diseases common in water dogs. There are some incredible clubs out there, ones that are far less known than the AKC that actually do give a damn about their animals. After all, if you're joining a club for your dog, shouldn't your dog's well-being be the first priority? I'm not saying that it isn't for any AKC breeders or dog owners, of course, but it sure as hell isn't for the AKC themselves. Now, before we continue on to talk about the AKC and their opposition to laws regarding dog welfare and well-being, let's just take a moment to thank today's sponsor who allows me to even make these types of sensitive videos in the first place. We've all got goals, be healthy, find a better work-life balance, improve our friendships, but have you ever thought about your hair goals? Well, that's where Function of Beauty steps in. Function of Beauty is the world leader in customizable beauty, offering precise formulations for your hair's specific needs. First, take a quick but thorough quiz to tell them a little bit about your hair type and your hair goals, such as lengthening, volumizing, and oil control. For me, I always select moisturizing and lengthening because I have long hair and I live in a dry climate, so I wanna make sure those things are taken care of. Then you choose your color and fragrance or go fragrance and dye free. I personally choose the teal kind of color and I also do the peach scent because I will never get over the smell of peaches. And then Function of Beauty determines what's the right formula for you and bottle it up and ships it right to you. So never be disappointed with your hair care again. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash casket to take your quiz and save 20% on your first order. And that also applies to their full range of customizable hair, skin, and body products. Again, go to functionofbeauty.com slash casket to let them know we sent you and get 20% off your first order. Functionofbeauty.com slash casket. Today's episode is also sponsored by Canva Pro. Now, many of you are already familiar with the fact that I cannot do Photoshop and I'm probably one of the only YouTubers, I swear to God, that do not know how to use Photoshop. So for me, when it comes to creating content like thumbnails and like just, I don't know, general Photoshoppy type posts, but 
very much so with thumbnails. I struggle a lot and that's where Canva Pro steps in. And I'm really grateful they reached out and sponsored me because I've been using them, I'm 90% sure since like 2016. Like we are years deep with Canva. And simply put, Canva Pro is the easy to use design platform that has everything you need to design like a pro. So whether you're a professional or just getting started, Canva Pro can help you boost you and your team's productivity and creativity. And it's quick, easy, and it's affordable. Canva Pro has everything you need in one place, including a collection of over 75 million premium photos, videos, audio, and graphics. Plus Canva Pro comes with time-saving tools that simplify and speed up the creative process. So if you wanna design like a pro with Canva Pro, right now you can get a free 45-day extended trial when you use my promo code. Simply go to canva.me slash casket to get your free 45-day extended trial. That's C-A-N-V-A dot M-E slash casket. Canva.me slash casket. One thing that particularly interested me as I was reading through these articles was how they made mention of the AKC preventing laws that would help animal welfare. That's obviously like a huge red flag. And while what we have just read is horrific enough, there's an extra kind of scummy you have to be as a business to not only turn your back on the animals that are being abused, but to stop others from helping them. The New York Times writes, Critics say the AKC has opposed legislation that would improve conditions for animals and reduce the number of abusive high volume breeders. The AKC and its members are active in Washington and in state politics, spending thousands of dollars in campaign donations and influencing efforts, including specific caps on the number of litters kennels could breed. And some coalitions of minimal living standards and the use of tethers, including efforts in Oregon, North Carolina, Georgia, New York, New Hampshire, and California. Among the legislation the AKC opposed was a Rhode Island bill that would prevent dogs from being placed in cages or tethered for more than 14 hours a day. The AKC opposed the bill because it featured language that was far more burdensome than just regarding tethering and confinement. Peterson, that same communications director we mentioned earlier said, the bill was so broadly worded that it could impact the ability for individuals to keep animals confined in a fenced in yard or in a suitable pen during the day while owners were at work and at night while owners are asleep. In Massachusetts, the AKC opposed a bill that further defined how law enforcement could go on about seizing animals from people suspected of animal cruelty and charge those convicted with the costs of caring for those animals. AKC is critical of proposals that attempt to permanently take dogs away from their owner defendants who have not been found guilty of any crime, Peterson said. From co-owners not party to the judicial procedure and from individuals who because of the cost of litigation may not be able to afford expensive care bonds. In Louisiana, the AKC opposes a bill that would have prevented the stacking of wire floored cages. Crates or other cage type enclosures are commonly stacked in a safe and sanitary manner in veterinary offices, kennels, sporting events, homes, shows, and during transportation, Peterson said. Prohibiting the use of these configurations could result in greater expenses for owners and animal related services or sports without any improvement in animal care they really do seem to have an excuse for just every single piece of legislation that comes through trying to protect these animals. I mean, sure, if someone hasn't been convicted of a crime, I get why taking away their animals might be a bit extreme, but if there is you know, very just reasoning, then gee, I don't know, the complaint stacking up against a man with 160 dogs that the AKC said was abiding by the rule book, then you know, I'm absolutely for playing it safe. If the wording or requirements of these bills was disagreeable, that's one thing, but I haven't gotten the impression that AKC cares as to why they were introduced in the first place, to protect animals. Not to mention, it's not just a few bills where they've disagreed on the wording here or there, but it's 80 bills or regulations that they've actively lobbied against. The Philadelphia Inquirer says that some are unnecessary as basic care standards for dog breeders, banning 24 seven dog changing, outlawing debarking without a medical reason and making it illegal to leave a dog in a hot car. And yes, devocalization or debarking is just as cruel and inhumane as it sounds. It's a surgical procedure to resect the dog's vocal cords or folds, and it takes away a dog's voice. And there's a massive amount of risk involved in that too, like bleeding, acute air swelling, infection, scarring. Supposedly 20% of all dogs that undergo this surgery need revision surgery afterwards. I struggle to find a reason where you would need to debark your animal and like, I was able to work with Casper, right? And I worked on training him really, really hard because he was very vocal in the beginning, but he's not debarked by any means. He fully can bark when when he needs to, he absolutely does. So the thought of someone getting a dog and then not giving a damn enough to wanna train it and work with it every day, because it really is an everyday thing. You have to work with your animal. 
Um, I don't know how to respond to that, but to instead just go, yeah, we're gonna do this surgery that is like risky and it could probably hurt the dog more. And then there's like, you know, a one in four chance that they're gonna have to essentially get the surgery redone again. Like, hmm, hmm. And AKC is uh, for that. Now, if there truly is a medical like reason, then yes, that's one thing. And there should be a law allowed for that, but it was simply to outlaw debarking without a medical reason. And yet in 2016, they said they opposed the ban, which mercifully passed without them because it restricts the rights of dog owners to make viable, safe decisions on behalf of their pets. Like, how is that safe? We just went over the side effects and how many often need revision surgery. And then the AKC argued it was safe. First of all, dogs can be trained to not bark excessively. Secondly, if you live in a community where your noisy dog isn't welcomed, in my opinion, you've got two options. One is to train them, bring them to a doggy daycare when you're not home. Like there are options out there. And the second is to remove them from the community entirely by finding a home where they can be loud or you know where they're not gonna bother you or somebody else. Literally removing the dog's voice just isn't a fucking option, okay? Like I, I don't care. I. I'm sure people are gonna disagree with me over this one, but the side effects, the physical pain and emotional distress of the animal, like it's linked to destructive behavior and an increase in threats to the safety of the dog because of their inability to communicate. The Humane Society gave yet another example of this though. So let's take a look. And I did mention this one in my previous episode on shady breeders, but for any of you who didn't see that one, I'm just gonna go briefly over this specific bill again, but in a little bit more detail. It is a cruel irony when an organization that touts itself as a champion of dogs works behind closed doors to oppose a wide range of animal welfare bills, including those advanced to crack down on cruel puppy mills. But that is exactly what the American Kennel Club has been doing for years. And now AKC has done it again in New Hampshire, where it's helped kill a bill that would have protected dogs raised, mistreated, and neglected by unscrupulous breeders. The bill in question was Senate Bill 569, introduced by Senator Jeb Bradley, Republican Wolfsboro, with the support of Governor Chris Sununu after a high profile rescue of 84 Great Danes from a mansion in Wolfsboro, New Hampshire in June last year. We have extensively covered the rescue, which the Humane Society of the United States assisted and subsequent developments, including the trial of the defendant, Christina Fay, her sentencing, her appeal, and her conviction last month of 17 counts of cruelty. Even as the trial has played out and as Faye awaits final sentencing, the dogs have remained in legal limbo. We are committed to caring for them through the entire legal process and the cost of looking after them have reached almost $2 million and counting. SB 569 was supported by local animal shelters, law enforcement, prosecutors, animal control officers, all to put some of the financial burden of caring for these animals on their abusers like Faye, as opposed to taxpayers. The bill flew through the state Senate with bipartisan support. And yet when it reached the House Environment and Agriculture Committee, things changed. A former chairman there is also a former director of the AKC, so conflict of interest much? The bill was stripped of its upgrades and commercial breeding regulations. The AKC literally handed out $1,000 in cash as a thank you to this chairman and the bill was defeated. As an aside, apparently the numbers of laws and bills they oppose is actually far higher than 80 and that source may be a bit outdated. The Humane Society now claims that it has surpassed 200. But yet again, there's still more examples. In Oregon, lawmakers introduced a bill in 2009 that aimed to limit to 25 the number of sexual intact dogs a breeder could have. Ted Paul, a collie breeder and judge at dog shows for more than 40 years in South Salem, Oregon, was asked by state lawmakers to support the bill. A longtime member and past president of the Collie Club of America, he agreed, saying he thought it could curb abuses. Paul said that he was branded a traitor on the internet and that the AKC affiliated dog show organizers stopped using him as a judge. I was surprised by the backlash, he said. The Oregon bill passed, but Paul said he has been completely ostracized from judging competitions since he advocated breeding limits. He now owns two rescue dogs, including Precious, who because of puppy mill related defects has jaw problems causing her tongue to always stick out. You have to breed with the best interests at heart, Paul said. Paul may have been surprised by the backlash, but unfortunately I'm not. Not only does the AKC not give a shit about an animal's welfare clearly, considering the locations they've allowed to pass inspection, if they inspect at all, but they ostracize those that put animals first. Now let's get to the last aspect of the AKC I wanted to cover today, and that is their dog shows. The Westminster Dog Show put on by the Westminster Kennel Club was founded in Manhattan in 1877. They predate the AKC, they're not the same two groups. However, pets at these shows of course have to be recognized by the AKC and of course the AKC has their own dog show as well, the Centennial. 
These shows have been called a celebration of dogs. And to some extent, I agree that they celebrate well-trained dogs. But again, there's something that does bother me about only purebreds being allowed to participate, further emphasizing the idea that purebred dogs are superior when in actuality, they're more likely to be plagued with a myriad of health issues. There are some practices done for these shows and for appearances sake that ranges from mildly interesting to downright cruel. There's bonding glues like Torbot bonding cement or even super glues that owners have used on their dogs to make ears stand up better. Some people in forums explain it's simply done to strengthen cartilage or a brace system that cuts down on ear infections. And the German shepherd Corner says it's a good way to correct ears that do need strengthening. Yet there's other practices that are, well, a bit more like cosmetic surgery. Docking, removing part or all of a dog's tail, usually with surgical scissors, is done when a dog is just a few days old and their tail is still soft. This surgery is also known as bobbing. Docking's usually performed by a veterinarian or breeder without anesthesia, the rationale being that although it certainly causes pain, the puppy isn't fully alert yet and won't remember it, says Emily patterson Kane, PhD and animal welfare scientist at the American Veterinary and Medical Association. patterson Kane doesn't support the procedure herself. Cropping, cutting off the floppy part of a dog's ear is usually performed on anesthetized dogs between six and 12 weeks old. The ears are then taped to a hard surface for several weeks while they heal to stay upright. AKC on the other hand says these practices are integral to defining and preserving breed character. In other words, they like the aesthetic because there's no reason for it. Not that they list anyway. I understand that in extreme medical cases, maybe if a dog's tail has been broken or something of that nature, that it might make sense, but defining breed character, that's not a valid reason to me anyway. Not when dog tails can develop nerve tumors, cause pain, and this can potentially interfere with the dog's ability to interact with other dogs since they express emotion through their tails. The AVMA or American Veterinary Medical Association states that there's no sufficient justification for performing it. So long as one given is cosmetic and in the largest study to date on tail injuries in dogs, the incidence rate was 0.23%. And even working dogs are not at significantly greater risk than non-working dogs. Instead, it's dogs that are kenneled that are at greater risk of injury. Of course, the AKC doesn't seem to agree with the AVMA here though. And they insist that docking and ear cropping ensure the safety of working dogs. The AKC stated, mislabeling these procedures as cosmetic is a severe mischaracterization that connotes a lack of respect and knowledge of history and the function of purebred dogs. Breed standards are established and maintained by AKC parent clubs. Each of the 158 AKC registered breeds is stewarded by a breed specific parent club keeping foremost in mind the welfare of the breed and the function it was bred to perform. Now, dumb question here. What does the AKC think the function of purebred dogs is, aside from looking pretty? Do they actually want the dogs to function well? Because I mean, the Border Collie Club wants their dogs to be healthy enough to be herders, so they argued not to be part of the AKC. If the AKC wants purebred dogs to function, then why don't they care about their health? I don't understand how they could possibly argue that docking tails and cropping ears is showing respect to a dog that literally didn't ask for that unnecessary surgery. Spaying and neutering an animal has legitimate benefits, is not just about improving behavior, but it strengthens their lifespan. There's a reduced risk of cancers, it prevents overpopulation, roaming, and behaviors when intact animals are aggressive or upset because, well, they can't mate. Aside from this, and aside from surgeries that are genuinely needed to improve the quality of life of your pet, why give them cosmetic surgeries? Why? Cropping and docking can absolutely have side effects. So why subject an animal to that? One vet states, humans also subconsciously and consciously use ear position and tail attitude to understand dogs. Many people instantly become wary of dogs with cropped ears and missing tails, and they are more likely to show fear. The dog is great at picking up on fear cues, which will hinder the relationship from one dog to another dog and from the dog to the human. Biting and fighting can ensure when a dog or human do not understand each other. It is best to give your dog the best chance of growing into a well-adapted socialized pet and keeping the ears intact is another way to help do that. I also hear a lot of ear infections in adult dogs who have had their ears cropped as a puppy. This is because ears help prevent debris and dirt from entering the ear canal. If the dog's ears have been cropped, the defense mechanisms are hindered. Thus, I definitely do not recommend ear cropping or tail docking, and I do not perform the procedure unless it is truly for health-related reasons, such as tail cancer or ear cancer. The AKC, in my opinion, deserves all the bad press it gets, and then some. They've funded some canine health research over the years, of course. Yet, as one source is quick to point out, they themselves are the ones creating these issues by packing dogs into a genetic corner. The AKC won't take responsibility for AKC breeders. And I repeat, the AKC. 
does not take responsibility for AKC breeders. So how is their role passive as they seem to imply? And again, how can they say they care about the welfare of dogs when they do this and advocate for unnecessary surgeries? With all of that being said though, that is where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I can't say that I hope you enjoyed it, but if you did learn something new today, make sure that you did like, subscribe, follow, so that you can stay up to date on even more episodes just like this one. Thank you all for being here for today's episode. Love you all, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.